last month we went through going back to our Bethel. And for Bethel might be different for other places. It might be that place in your room when you first heard about God. It might be when you're a little child when God came and spoke to you. It might be as an adult that you've gone through so much and God came and said, do you remember when I first said do you, you're going to see different from me? Do you remember when I first told you you're going to hear different from me? Do you remember when I told you if you do X, Y, and Z, I'm going to come and meet you? And that led us into this series that we're going through for this month, the word becoming flesh. And we heard last week about Miss Pastor Nee explaining to us that Christmas is the reason for the season. Christmas is why we're here. Christmas is why we come to church. And what does that mean? That means that there was this man named Constantine that God used to make this a holiday. That every single Christmas, every single December 25th, since that, that time, that we celebrated the Lord Jesus Christ and his birth. Was Jesus really born in December? No. Was Jesus, was all these things that they bring up about buying gifts and all these other things they cause us to do in our nation, especially America, what the season was about? No. But what it was about bringing Christ to the forefront, showing people the importance of Jesus, showing him that we can see what the promises of God were for our lives. So we're going to go to our text, our text that we read in our Bibles um, reading this morning, and it's going to come from Romans chapter 8, verses 28 through 29, all right? It's a familiar text, and it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did pre predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the for firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did pre predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. We shall, we, what shall we say, what shall then we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Is it God that justifieth? Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died. Yes, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall it be tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we have read this text today, it might not mean a lot to you. And that's probably because for a lot of us, the, the word has not been made flesh to us. We read King James and it goes over our heads. We don't speak in thou, thou art, therefore. We don't talk like that today. So a lot of times you see Christians don't really understand the gift and the promise that we have. We see that from generation to revelation. There was promises the Lord made concerning with man and who was to come and why he was to come. And we see that the father of our faith promised us that Jesus Christ was going to come down for the final war. And sometimes the final war is not just the one in Revelation, but it's the things that you go through daily, the problems, the struggles, the habits that you're going for. And we have to all realize that we have a promise in Jesus Christ that is going to arise in us. Okay. But first, we, before we get to know the promises, why do we need Jesus? Why did we need the name of Jesus? Why did we need that name, that power to come down as flesh, as an arm, as feet, as legs into our life? First, we need to know that we need a sacrifice that could answer from the beginning. How many of us know that Psalm 51 says that we were all shaped in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me? I don't know about you, but I know tons of people whose parents weren't together when they had them, right? I know tons of people whose moms and dads made mistakes even before we got here. I know that I come from somebody they call Adam and Eve. Are we all on one accord? 
And we all know what Adam and Eve did. They disobeyed God. So it doesn't matter how holy you think you are, how right you are. We needed a sacrifice that could answer from us from the beginning. Number two, we needed to know that sin cannot walk into the presence of the almighty God and that we needed to be made righteous again. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 21, it says, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The Bible says that God cannot behold iniquity. Does anybody know what iniquity is? It is sin. It is the immoralness of man. It is grossly unfair behavior. How many people have kids? And when you see your kids act bad, what do you want to do? You want to choke them. You want to knock their heads off. And when we sin, God looks at us that way. Does that make sense? He is the good father. You want to smack your kid. But we needed something that kept us from the smacking of God. Does that make sense? We needed something that was going to stand there and say, okay, I'm going to be wounded for your transgressions. I'm going to be bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace is going to be upon me. And with your stripes, I am healed. That's what Jesus is for us. Isaiah 53 and 5. Okay. All right. And we're going to go to the next one. It says, we needed something to destroy the earthly mindset that brought death. In the garden, in uh, Genesis chapter 3, we remember that the enemy came and spoke to Adam and Eve. And the first thing he wanted to do is play mind games. What we need to know as as believers that the first battlefield over your whole life is in your mind. It's not something that's going to come up to you with a dagger and a pitchfork and stand there in a red clothing or a black clothing and have horns coming out their head. No, they send things to your mind. In Romans chapter 8 verses 6 through 7 it says, for to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So since the beginning, the devil has been playing tricks with the mind. He told, he told Eve, he said, you won't die if you eat this thing. And the problem was Eve didn't truly understand what death was. Death didn't have to come this day. Death was being separated from the Father. Death was not being able to walk with Jesus Christ. Death was not being able to accomplish what God put forth for your life. And the devil knew if I just said one thing mixed with the truth, I can get to your mind. So what we needed Jesus to do was to come and destroy the earthly mindset that death and that the devil had brought unto us, okay? And the last one, we needed to know that Jesus Christ would destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3 and 8 says, He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of of the devil. How many people have works going on in their life that you're looking for God to answer for you? Whether it be in marriage, whether it be in financially, whether it be emotionally, we all needed somebody to come and destroy the works of the devil. All right, so now that we know what our problems were (laughs) and what we needed God to do, we want to know what does the promise of Jesus being made flesh do for us? All right, and we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 10. Verses 10, I mean, verses 4 through 12. It says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it was written written of me to do thy will. O oh God, above when he said, sacrifice an offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then he said, lo, I come to do thy will, O oh God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By which will, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. Who is here that we have happy and here that knows that Jesus Christ stands in the gap for us forever? 
The thing that we know the promise does for us is that it is a sacrifice that will never end. It will always work. It will always cry out. A dog can't cry out for you. Uh, you're, more, you're higher than that. A bird can't cry for you. We don't chirp. Don't we speak? We don't bark. We're not dogs. We're not all these animals that they kept on giving blood and sacrifices to the Lord, thinking that it would do the work for us. No, we have somebody that is more than that. That is Jesus Christ who speaks for us. Number two, it provides a mediator that speaks every language. I don't know about you, but I know a lot of nationalities. I even know for myself that I'm full-blooded African. I can't even speak all the dialects my family can. Does that make sense? My dad speaks several. My dad is one tribe. My mom is one tribe. And then I was born in America. And sometimes in our lives, we have things crying out against us. And we don't even know what languages they're speaking. We don't even know what, what means they're using to talk about us. And we see in Hebrews chapter 12 and 24, it says, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood sprinkling, speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus speaks better things than the blood of Abel. So for, for generations, there has things been going on that we didn't know in our lives. The New Living Trans um, Translation describes the blood of Abel as the blood of vengeance. We've had many things calling out, saying that we should suffer because of what X, Y, and Z said. We should be punished because of what our grandparents did. We should not be delivered because of what somebody else did towards our lives. And today we need to know that Jesus Christ came as the mediator, the one who sp spoke every language on the earth, the one that can answer from the beginning. And he will be the, he will be the one to go against the, the, the accuser of the brethren. In Revelations 12, 10, the, we refer to the enemy as the accuser of the brethren. For many times, the devil has been crying out against you, saying, no, you don't deserve this, saying, no, you've done wrong. And you're wondering, why is things not working out for me? We need to know that today we have a mediator that speaks in every courtroom and speaks against every accusation, and he will continue to do so for us in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The next one we go to, what does the promise of the Lord do for us? It says it causes the true lion to speak against any sacrifice or any roar that is being made against our lives. For I don't know about you, but I know I come from a background in my father's house. They were chiefs. And if anybody knows about political things in Africa, those people do some things to get in power that they have no business doing, okay? And you see about these, sometimes we think the things that are going on in people's lives are like Dis the Disney Channel. You might see them cast a spell or they might say, hocus pocus. But for us who come from another line, we know these things are not a joke. We know that they're crying out against us. We know they go to the mountaintops. They go, we say, we call it look grunt. They open the, the, the ground and call upon your destiny. We know they go to the water spirits and they do different things. We know that these things are true and they're not just what the Disney Channel has presented to our kids as a joke. And the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. The devil is rolling around looking for who he can beat up on, who he can blame for something wrong. But the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy that we can call upon the Lord who is a jealous God. The God who has mercy on us. The God who comes and shows mercy to those who love him. All right. And in Revelations 5 and 5, it says, and one of the elders said unto me, weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Is anybody else happy that I have a lion roaring on my behalf? That we have a lion crying out for us. That we have somebody who was crying against all the sacrifices that were made against our families, against our children, against our hope, against our glory, and against our destiny. Number four, we come to see that the promise recovers man's full access to the Lord. I don't know about you, but sometimes I get tired. I don't want to be around people. I don't want to be here. I don't want to go through what I'm going through. Sometimes I just want to lay down, cry, and go to sleep. But we can't do that. But we have somebody that we need that can help us. 
And it says it recovers to his access. Matthew 27, 51, it says, And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to the bottom, and the earth did quake and the rocks rent. That means that every separation, every curtain that was between us and God has been removed because Jesus Christ came and gave us access to the Father. In Hebrews 9, 6 and 10, it says, Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. All right. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiness of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. Now, verse nine, which was a figure for the time then present and which were well, sorry, and which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and corn carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. See, I don't know about you and me, but I'm human just like you. And sometimes people get confused when they see somebody present something from the pulpit. They think that they're not going through the same thing you're going through. We put preachers and priests and all these other people on high pedestals and you don't realize that the devil comes for them more than he comes from the average person because he wants you to look bad. Every time somebody claims that they met Jesus, that they are saved, the devil wants to make a spectacle of you. And that's why we needed somebody who understood that we are human, that he can make the sacrifice for us. Somebody who doesn't have a spot, somebody who doesn't have issues, somebody that doesn't go through worries, somebody who's not broke, somebody who doesn't have to go to work every day. But his job is to stand before the king of glory and make intercession for you every day. That that means that Jesus Christ has given us full access to the Lord. And now when I pray, I don't have to worry about somebody else's problems coming before or somebody else's thoughts coming about me to the Lord. But God's perfect thoughts towards me will be heard in my prayers because Jesus Christ has made a way from us for us. Number five, it says it provides separation from the wrong connections. Now, this is big. I don't know about you, but I have friends that I don't need to go around anymore. Does that make sense? When I was worldly, I used to do certain things. There's a brother in our church, and he talks about how he used to hang around and drink, and one day God came over him, and there was a complete difference in him. And he doesn't know that story made a difference for me. That's the when I heard him talk about, it's not that he thought he was better. He just knew that one day something changed in his life. And now when you hear him pray, when you hear him speak, you can hear the Holy Spirit all over him. It makes me smile to say, man, God is good. God can come and touch your life. And one day what you used to do and what used to be okay is not okay anymore. That's the kind of separation God does for us. The word tells us that he came to separate son from father, mother and daughter, friends and past acquaintances. I don't know about you, but I even have family members I do not want to be around. I'm sorry if you're watching this, but I got to stay away, if that makes sense. And it doesn't matter what culture you are, where you come from. We've all had friends and people we used to hang around that we did the wrong stuff with okay in uh, Romans chapter 8 and 15 I have joy because the Bible talks about the spirit of adoption you have to know that you're not alone but Jesus Christ can come and take you from your old bloodline take you from your old acquaintances take you from your old association and give you a new family a new set of friends a new holiness a new kingdom that you are made to be a part of all right the word says that his word towards us is like a new covenant that means it's a new agreement. It's a new document. It's something new that washed away all the old. So everything that people used to know about you, and sometimes people will see you and associate those things from, know that in Romans 18, it tells you that that's been washed away. That you don't have to walk away around with that guiltiness anymore. You don't have to walk away with those certain shames, with those certain characteristics, with the attributes they alluded to when they called up your name, that Jesus Christ gave us a new name. That with number four, he gave us a mark. By the washing of the blood that we were washed away, every mark, every identity issue, every old trait that you had, that Jesus Christ came and did it for us. It says we needed to be separated from the wrong reports concerning our lives, from broken 
brokenheartedness, from separation from things holding our lives captive, from imprisonment on our minds, from bondage, from feeling, from feelings of not being worthy, from separation from losing a team or losing associations, separation from depression, from ugliness, a feeling that you're not worth it, from anxiety, from the weight and the offenses of the world. All of us have been offended. All of us at one time have looked, been looked at like we're nothing. All of us have been associated to be not cool enough, not good enough, not worthy enough. But we need to know that Jesus Christ came to make that separation. Today, we hear it a lot of times in the medical field. Psychologists use it all the time that so many people are going through depression, that so many people have a lack of confidence or esteem, that they diagnosed us with things that Jesus Christ didn't do for us. But we need to know that in number five, Jesus Christ gave and came and gave us something that breaks all of it. And it's going to come from Isaiah 61 verses one through three. It's called the spirit and the anointing of the Lord. The spirit and the anointing of the Lord. The scripture says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to com comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. Is anybody happy that the heaviness that was on you yesterday doesn't have to follow you today? That the mourning that was on you this morning can be made joy. That everywhere we were called unrighteousness, he has put your roots in him and you're flourishing like a tree to be made whole. I don't know about you, but I'm happy that that promise brought me that spirit, his spirit and the anointing of the Lord. Finally, we come to number five, uh, number six of knowing what the promises of the flesh do in our lives. And it says that it gave us the law of the spirit of life. All right. And we're going to take that text from Romans chapter eight, verses two through five. And again, the law of the spirit of life. It says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemns sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. All right. We are blessed to know that the law of the spirit of the life has come upon us and that from the here on forth, that that law has made a change and taken us from deadly things to living things that we will now exercise what God has done for us. All right, we need to know that the promise in the Lord of the Lord upon us provides a continuous call to the hearts of man and awakening of love. As we read in our, in our scripture, in our test, we, text, we know that God predestined us to come unto him, okay? That it wasn't just an occurrence, that Jesus Christ come upon us and that he called us and he has justified us. So everything that was calling us the wrong things, he made us right. Everywhere I was wrong, everywhere I've been feeling like, what did I do wrong? Why is this happening to me? Why am I failing that God already called us out and he saw our problems before and he already judged on our behalf, all right? We needed to know that he cries out before us and for all of the things that he's done for us. And we need to know that we are no longer what they call thems. I'm, I'm going to make this... I'm going to make this easy for us to understand. So if in Romans chapter 8 and 30, it says, More, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. I'm crying because I don't know how many of you have been called a them. A them that you're not good enough. A them that you're not worthy. A them that you should not stand before and do great things. A them that you will not make it. A them that you will not have. 
But I have a God that calls forth the thens. If you read the word of God, you see that they them David. They them them and hate. They tried to kill him. If you read the word of God, they laughed at Noah. But God chose the drunk to build the boat that would save the world. They called Joseph that dreamer. They deemed him a them, but he was the one that they used in Egypt to deliver men out of bondage and take them to Goshen. I don't know how many of you have been called a them, but they have called me them many times in my life. They have said she's a them. She's not good enough. She's a them. She might think she's all that. She's a them. And I don't know if you are them. You might be a them that they didn't think could do it. A them that they didn't think could amount to anything. A them that couldn't break forth or break free from family curses or bondage. But I'm telling you, we serve the living God that predestined before what you look like today or yesterday. He already saw who you were. He saw what you were meant to be. He saw that his promise would come forth for you and take you to where he called you to be. That his eternal glory will fall upon you. So today, I thank God. God, that he put a call upon us, that he predestined us thems to be somebody, that no longer are we over underdogs, but God calls you out of darkness, that God calls you out of shame, that God calls you out of sickness, that God calls you out of poverty, and he makes those them somebody. My God predestined us, and in that predestination, we are going somewhere because of the promise of the flesh of Jesus Christ being made destined and permanent in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The next point is we obtained a lawyer that is licensed in all practices. I don't know about you, but there's prayers I have been praying for years. God, come and deliver me. God, come and save me. God, come and heal me. And sometimes you might get a dream that shows you who the source is. You might get a revelation. But who is looking for a lawyer? How many people that do we know that can afford a lawyer? that can go and say, can I have a consultation so you can fight my case? But God said he was going to provide us a spotless sacrifice, a payment above all payments, somebody who will speak on my behalf, somebody who will cry out in the wilderness, somebody who will talk to every power. I want to tell you in eight, Romans 8, 28, it says that that word will be made manifest in your life, that the word of God will rise up a lawyer for you among everything, that he will Will talk for you that he has come to be our propitiation. First John 2 and 2. That it said that he is our propitiation, that he is the satisfaction of every payment they are calling for for your life. I want you to know that Jesus Christ was made manifest because he is the satisfaction for everything they are accusing you for. He is the satisfaction for every finger pointed against you. He is the satisfaction for every voice crying out against you. I want you to know that we have a life that has a license to practice every law, a liar to address every accusation, every courtroom, a lawyer who will cry out and his anointing will break the yoke that they have been using to hold you bondage. That's what the promise of the flesh does for you. That's what the promise of the flesh does for you, that everywhere you have been waiting for God to arise in your life, he must come forth when you know his word. He must answer for you when you have an expectation on him. He must answer for you when you demand it to come to pass in your life. I don't know if you guys know about this show. It, it's, on, it's run by the CW. It's called Manifest. Has anybody seen it? It's called Manifest, but let me give you a breakdown about this show. There's a family, and they took a flight um, to, like, the Caribbean somewhere, and they were on a plane, and when they were coming back on their returning flight, it was a family of six, the grandmother, the grandfather, the son, and the daughter. And then the son has a wife and some kids, and the daughter came with her fiancé. And they were all to take a flight, but something happened, and the, the flight to bring them back to New York was too full. So they said, okay, if some of you decide, will choose to get on this second flight, we'll give you some of the money for your ticket, right? And anybody who has sense, you, when you fly overseas, you want some of your money back. Has anybody gone on a plane? Those tickets are high, right? A plane ticket will hurt you sometimes. You're like, ooh, especially when you're traveling overseas. So the son 
the son who has the wife and the kid, and the sister said, we'll stay, you guys go. And the basis of the show is based on Romans 8, 28. And the girl's mother, the grandmother, would always say to the daughter, for all things work together for those. She will always say that. For all things work together for those who, who trust in the Lord, you know? And the girl was like, I'm so tired of listening to my mom say this all the time. Mom, leave me alone. But what happened is, on the second flight where the son, the daughter, and the kids were on, there was turbulence on the plane. And for about five minutes, you just thought it was normal for turbulence, for turbulence to hit. But then they finally came down and they landed. And when they landed, they saw police cars coming up to them and all these weird vehicles. And they're like, what's going on? And they said, sorry to inform you, but it's been over five or eight years since your flight last took off in the Caribbean and you're here. We believed all of you all to be dead. Isn't that awkward? So one of the children of the man, the boy has a twin sister. And when they landed, the little boy is still at six and the big sister is now at 16. And they're looking at each other. And the little girl used to always tell her mom, I can feel him, he's not dead. If anybody knows about twins, they can always feel each other. Twins always know each other. It doesn't matter what you do. She said, I can feel him. But the mom would say, you know, you need therapy. You're crazy. They've been dead. Let it go. And the mom was depressed because her and the daughter were having problems. Well, anyway, fast forward through the story. The husband is now at home, but he doesn't know the wife had remarried. He doesn't know they had moved on because it's eight years later. But the problem is this has made headlines all over the world. These people came back after eight years. And when headlines hit, other things get informed that you're back to. And if anybody's in America, we have something called insurance policies. <laughs> it's not like Africa where you keep the money because you guys got to pay cash. In America, we have insurance to make sure that everything will be covered. And the lady had already cashed in the insurance checks on her son and her husband. Ooh. This is millions of dollars. And they were scared. What is going to happen? What's going to happen? But that father came down. He was a lawyer. And he went through all the clauses of the paperwork and found out that Flight 828 was never in the insurance clause for them to pay back the money. And I say this to you today. I don't know if it's a big deal to you, but millions of dollars would mean a lot to me. My house would mean a lot to me. My children, our clothes on our backs would mean a lot to you, to me. But that's what Jesus Christ comes and does for us. He goes through all the paperwork with his blood and he washes every accusation off and he pays back every sin for you and he addresses every accusation against you. That's what the blood made flesh does for you. It, it, it attacks eight year old sins, generational sins, powers and things that had been crying out for you. So just like the father in the show manifest, that's what our heavenly father did for us when he sent his son. We need to realize that we've been given a black card in heaven. If anybody knows what a black card is, it's, it's a credit card that there's no limitation on how much you can pay for with it. We swipe it every time we say in Jesus' name. We swipe it every time we call upon the blood of the lamb. Every time we remember what that cross did for us, we have a spiritual black card <laughs> that can pay for anything for our lives. Number four, we need to know that the blood creates a new state of mind, a renewed consciousness. Mr. Nee, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, sir. Pastor Nee was talking about this in Sunday school this, this morning. Romans 9, 9 tells us that even though priests were going through the steps to purge the sin, their state of mind was not right. All right. It says man is still subject to think or project imaging. That is not the perception of God for your case. We're all human. Right. You look at people like, ah, this girl, look at this girl, look at this boy. They're nothing. But we need somebody that doesn't have the perception of man to look at our case. We need somebody that doesn't see all of our thoughts, all of our wrongdoings. We need something that cries out for us. Romans 9 and 14 tells us how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Meaning the blood washes away old mindsets, projected thoughts, 
things that came from the enemy, things that are internalized against you, towards you. Sometimes it's to internalized and it comes from others towards you. And sometimes it's about you for you. Sometimes you don't think you're good enough. Sometimes you don't think you deserve that thing. Sometimes you don't even believe that your deliverance can come. But Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh, so is he. The blood, the promise of the blood being made flesh is that God can showcase who he is in you, inside a church, outside a church, wherever you are. He can tear down the systems, the rituals, the perception of others that might take over your thoughts. Romans 12, 2 says that your mind can be completely transformed when the word is flesh in your mind. That there's a renewal, a shifting, a, a, a uplifting. That the impossible will become possible. That the issues can no longer be made manifest. That the old cannot come with the new. See, we are walking vessels. Consciously walking out, 2 Corinthians 10 and 5. The scripture says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against a knowledge of God. See, we're supposed to be the manifestation of the word of God. That we're going to walk out what scripture says towards us. That we're going to leap with faith. That we're going to run through a troop and fight over every wall. That nothing can hinder us. See, we're supposed to be what they see on the earth as Jesus Christ moving. That we are the word made flesh. All right? That we're going to destroy the speculations. We're going to destroy the lofty things risen up against us. And no longer will they be able to captivate or take captive our thoughts. See, once the mind is transformed by Christ, we can move into the word being made flesh in our lives. And we can see number five. That you must believe that the manifestation of our promise is possible. Now, 1 Peter 2 and 9 says that, but ye are ch a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. I don't know about you, but I like to see what's going on. I like the lights cut on. I like to see the sun in the morning. I like to open window blinds. And that's how your life is before you know Christ. You're behind the blind. Nobody can see you for who you are to be. They, the, all the attributes, all the accusations, all the filthy words, that's what's on you. But as soon as Jesus Christ walked into your life, a light shines. And that manifestation of what he is, is possible over you. All right? So let the blood come over your consciousness and believe what God says he can do in your life. I don't know about you, but I'm excited to find out that the flesh was made possible in my life. That the word of God through Jesus Christ is upon me. Today we needed to access the Holy Spirit in order to regain spiritual insight and the revelation of his ways in order for the word of God to be made flesh in our lives. And Jesus did that for us. He came and washed away all the wrongs we had done. He paid all the prices we couldn't pay. He answered all the accusations I could not. But today, man needs to know that at one point we were poor in spirit, poor in faith, poor in morality, financially poor, poor in hope, poor in leadership. But he has made atonement for our sins. We need to know that the full spiritual laws to win our case all lie in one person, and that's Jesus Christ. Is there anywhere, any person today that hasn't answered that call? Is there any person today that doesn't know what Jesus can do for you? It's simple. All you have to do is say, Father, I've sinned. I'm sorry. Lord Jesus, I believe you're a Lord. Come into my life. And today, that flesh can be made whole. 